that's what we're going to do tonight. And we are talking to someone that I admire a great deal that I had the chance to work with um, for a period of time and who um, has beaten me at poker a few more times than I care to mention. Um, and I'm going to introduce her to you right now. Beth to Guzman, look at that beautiful okay. photo. Oh Is my God. <laughs> it's beautiful. Is VP digital and paperback publisher at Grand Central Publishing, where she oversees ebook publications and trade paperback and mass market programs across all genres and categories and acquires fiction and nonfiction. She works with James Patterson and Michael Connolly, sits in meetings with David Baldacci, Sandra Brown, Texan, Harlan Coben, and Nicholas Sparks, and is a proud graduate of UT Austin, who we expect to yell at some point this evening, Hook'em Horns. Hook'em um, Horns, so. yeah! <laughs> my UT sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> so please welcome everybody in whatever way you like to welcome people when you're virtually meeting them. Um, Beth de Guzman, thank you for being here tonight. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you everybody for coming. I am so happy to have this time to be able to answer any of your questions. I'm a big, big lover of genre fiction. If you had tuned in earlier, you would have heard me talking about Agatha Christie and David Lindsay and, uh, and, and some romances. So I love sharing everything I know about publishing. I love being encouraging to authors because we're always, always looking for new voices. So anything you want to ask me about genre fiction, I would be so happy to, to answer. Can I just add one thing to my bio? Of course. I love Beatles. I love shoes. And I love Cheetos. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> the Beatles or Beatles the, the animal? Or the, oh my God, John, John, Ford. John Paul George and Ringo, please. <laughs> I believe your bio used to also say that you love crosswords, but I thought that would take us off on a whole like crosswords conversation that no one wants to hear tonight. So um, <laughs> you have many interests, Beth de Guzman. So what I've done is I've put together um, a, what I've done is I've put together a list of questions, all of the questions that we received, and I've put them in order of sort of grouped thematically, and we're going to get to a lot of stuff as we go through, and then I reserve the right to chat with you a little bit, um, Beth, and ask my own questions as we're focusing on different genres, but we're going to start with a very basic um, question. So, you know, thinking about what genre fiction is, and I think, you know, especially, I appreciate this question because the words, the phrases, genre, categories, all of the different types of genre and categories are thrown around a lot. But this uh, question says, I've heard panel discussions where it's been stated that the genre categories are primarily for marketing. What are the benefits of fitting your fiction into a genre? So I thought we'd start with you being able to say, and you have so much experience with genre fiction. Um, what, from publishing's perspective, what is the purpose of, of a genre? This is such a smart, smart question. Whoever came up with this, obviously you've been in lots of panels before and you've heard smart people talk about it. It is true that it is very useful for marketing. Genre categories means there's a very, very established readership for a book, and that makes it so much easier to target. You have an idea of, of where these uh, readers go to get recommendations for the books. For example, if, you, if your genre is a mystery, there are lots and lots of mystery-oriented bloggers out there, so we would do outreach for them. And if you are a mystery lover and you pay attention to those bloggers, you will hear about the books. It is great for marketing for accounts. And by accounts, I mean the retailers, the places that sell uh, books because they buy by categories. There's a, you could talk to the romance buyer who knows all about romance and you present that to them and they will be able to buy what they think is the right quantity for them and merchandise them in their source in, in that way too. You can, you can buy, you can sell to the romance buyer at Target and that romance target buyer at Target will be able to figure out right away, oh, this is, a book that will do really well in my need to read section or my recommended read section. It makes the job of a publisher a lot easier that way because it is very, very set. It's very defined. Some people find that limiting because they feel, why should my book just be 
perfect for just be considered genre? Why should it just be considered romance? I always say it's always good to start with your strength. If your book is a romance, let's go ahead and, and market it to the to the romance reader. And then if it gets big and big and big, then you can find bigger and bigger audience. Does that answer that question? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it opens up a lot of other questions that I would have. And I think that um, one thing that I do want to touch on at this point, because we're going to dive into specific genres, but you just mentioned, you know, starting with your strength and, and often you'll hear folks describe their book and they will say it's historical, romance, speculative fiction. And I guess I'm just wondering from your point of view as a publisher, how do you figure out, you know, you can have the romance category and within it, you can have historical romance, but how do you start, what sort of questions do you ask or what are you looking for to figure out which is going to be the real big category? That is a, a newbie kind of mistake. They think, oh, if I say this is for science fiction readers, this is for romance readers, this is for mystery readers. They think it broadens the appeal of the book and what happens instead is it confuses what the book is about. Publishing is all about trying to find a focused message about the book so that when we advertise the book, when we do social media advertising, when you know the ad is that small, or when we do a strip ad in the, in, in the New York Times, if you're lucky enough to get New York Times advertising, there's only so much space you can you can use to very very clearly establish what this book is and who the reader for it is if we want to market it to science fiction to mystery to romance how do you telegraph all of that particular kind of reading in one small small advertising when i'm sell when i'm talking to my sales force and they say what well, Beth, how can we sell it to so many different buyers? There's only, there's a buyer for science fiction, there's a buyer for romance, there's a buyer for mystery. I can't sell it to every single one of those. So what happens is when we read the book, we try to figure out what is the strongest element of this book? Is this more of a romance book? Is this more of a, is the strength of this book the mystery aspect of it? Or if there's a science fiction aspect to it, fantasy aspect, what amazing um, amalgam of a, of a book this is. <laughs> is that the is that the portion that's the most that's the strongest aspect of the book? And then you then try to figure out how to make the book work for that particular category, so that you're always working from um, you're always leading with your best foot, always putting your best foot forward. Love it, thank you. We have had um, some lately horror and fiction seem to be getting combined into a mashup where you will have an upmarket horror. Do we want to position it as a horror? Do we want to position it as, as, a, as more of a literary fiction? For example, a book by Justin Crone in The Passage, which was published years ago. It has a very, uh, very fresh take on, um, on vampires. Is that horror? Is that fiction? He happened to have a background in literary fiction so when the publisher Bantam published this book, they skewed more toward that as opposed to genre because he already had a readership, he already had credibility in more of the literary fiction world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I wanna say that recently too, you've seen sort of um, literary thrillers seem to be like kind of taking off as well um, in the hardcover side of things. So, so we're going to talk more about sort of blending categories and that sort of thing, but I'm going to, I'm going to jump into our um, first category, uh, romance. So the question is, what does category romance mean? When you hear someone say category, this is category romance. Is that different from romance? Category romance is what is the term for books that are published by Harlequin, way back then when I started in publishing, there was another, uh, there was a, a silhouette and there was Second Chance at Love and Dell had an imprint called Love Sweat. These books were very, very specific in terms of the word count. So the books had to be like from 55,000 words to 60,000 words. And they either were all contemporaries or maybe Love Sweat, I think had a, not Love Sweat, Dell, had a, an imprint called Candlelight Ecstasy, and they had to be very, very, very sexy. So not only were they romances, but they were very, very specific kind of romances. And they tended to be published with the same kind of cover look, 
you know, different man, different woman, but it, um, it had the same cover look and they tended to be numbered on the spine. So this is Harlequin, Harlequin um, suspense, number one, number two, number three, number four. So it had a very serious feel to them. Romance is much, much more freewheeling. It's not published the length, it doesn't matter. It could be 55,000 words, it could be 95,000 words, it could be 125,000 words. However many words you need to tell your story, it's the, the covers are different depending on what the book's needs are, and there is no such numbering in, in, the, in the series. That's really, that's really the big difference. And also, category romance, um, you know, as I said, Harlequin silhouette, they have very, very specific needs. There's silhouette desire or Harlequin desire, and those are very, very, very sexy books. And they have an imprint for romantic suspense. They have an imprint, and they publish only romantic suspense there. They have an imprint for more women's fiction, issues-oriented kind of books. Whereas romance, it could be anything. We publish rom-com, we publish romantic suspense, we publish women's fiction. I have been told, and I have told others, so I would love to know if this is true, um, that within romance though so forget category romance because that's a very special sort of specific type of publishing right but within romance that there are certain expectations and sometimes folks use the word romance but maybe what they're really meaning is a love story but but you know if you're writing a romance today this is what somebody told me if you're writing a romance today and the two people don't end up together at the end it's not a romance would you agree with that? <laughs> Absolutely. And we have a lot of experience there at uh, where I work at Grand Center Publishing because we have a romance imprint called Forever. And we also happen to publish Nicholas Sparks. Nicholas Sparks is not a romance writer because even though the romance is a very, very important part of the book, there's not necessarily a happily ever after. If you are a Nicholas Sparks fan, you know that he tends to kill off one of his main characters in the end of the book. So that's not a happily ever after. It's very touching, it makes you cry, but that makes it not a romance. A romance, very focused on the romance, and there's uh, the relationship between, between two people, and sometimes between three people, sometimes between a person and a shapeshifter, but there's always a happily ever after. That okay. is one of, the, one of the main definitions of genre fiction is you, there, there are reader expectations, and the book has to fulfill those reader expectations for romance, it's happily ever after. I remember a long time ago, Silhouette decided to figure out how far they can stretch the definition of happily ever after. Could it, could it actually be so far as no, there's no happily ever after? And it was a good experiment and it was very, very clear that it was not what readers were looking for when they're looking for a romance. They want the characters to end up together at the end of the book. I love that. So I've been telling people something that was correct, which is nice. But, um, but You're I also always correct that. <laughs> Not correct. always, Beth. But I like that you talk about expectations because I want to talk about as as much as you're you know comfortable. Because I know there are probably categories you're you're more you know versed in. But you seem to know a lot about a lot of genres. Um, could we, as we go through these, sort of talk about expectations a little bit too, so that folks Absolutely. who are writing different genres can be thinking about that. So, um, and then Beth, oh. Beth was kind enough to send us some titles that she wanted to recommend. And so we're going to, when we talk about a category, we're going to at least throw up um, the book jackets. And if you want to say anything about the books, you're welcome to, or if there's anything particular that you think someone writing romance could learn from or might appreciate about either of these books, whatever you would want to do. Yeah, romance, you know, um, uh, popularity of certain tropes come and go. Historical romances were big years and years ago, and then there was a down cycle, and now they're very popular again. For the past several years, there have been two categories of subgenres of romances that have just proved immense staying power. Small Town Romance, Mermaid Inn, and Cowboy Romance, Carolyn Brown. I think you can, if you are interested in writing in those two categories, I think you'll be very, very safe knowing that uh, there will be at least one publisher interested in a book like that. What about a cowboy in a small town? Oh my God, perfect. <laughs> I, I think that, they, they always live in a small town, even though they have big, big ranches, it's always a small town, absolutely. You know one thing I would love? I would love, one thing we haven't, we haven't seen a lot of are um, black cowboys. 
I would love to see a black cowboy. There's one author, I wish I remembered her name. She does have a, a black cowboy series. I would love to see more. Yeah. All right. You guys heard it here first. I love it. Tell us every time what you're looking more for more of. We, we, we're happy to hear it. So then you also included romantic comedies. I'm assuming you guys probably have a pretty, um, pretty good list of romantic comedies uh, forever. Remember years ago when Chicklet was a big thing? And uh, romantic comedy is really the, the more modern version of Chicklet because it's, it tend, they tend to be about young women and uh, they always have a very, very funny voice, hence the comedy part. So we call them rom-com and they are so popular. One of the things I love about romantic comedies is that millennials, especially millennials who would never ever pick up a traditional romance like the cowboy romance, like the small town romance, they love romantic comedies. They love the fact that it's a trade paperback format, not a mass market format. And they love the look of the covers because they don't have you know, the bare chest of guy, as you saw in, um, in, cowboy, in the Cowboy Romance by Carolyn Brown. And it's the genre that's really, really exploding. We have older people reading them. We have younger people reading them. The Boyfriend Project, I'm very happy to say, was a selection of Book of the Month Club in May. And they published it as a hardcover. And they sold, oh my God, so many copies of it. So it's... Uh, it's Great a wonderful, wonderful category to be in. Love it. And Sajni was at Sajni Patel yes. was at our unconference that we hosted. You know, I do want to take a beat and answer, ask one of the questions that's in the chat box, because I know this category is not one that we have up here. So what can you say about the genre category of Westerns? Since we've talked about cowboys a little bit, but obviously under the, the category of romance, what can you say about, um, the Western category. When I, one of my very first jobs was at, was at Bantam and we published Louis L'Amour. And oh my God, that guy just, he was dead at that time. And he sold and sold and sold. And then his, um, his, uh, his, his son would find a partial manuscript and we would publish that and it would sell like crazy. And then they would find an outline and they would end up writing, getting somebody to write it and it would sell like crazy. People love Louis L'Amour. Westerns are not as popular as they once were. I think one of the things that maybe keeps it from being, getting very popular is it's not a genre that, that refreshes itself. It's not a genre that reacts to the times the way romance does. Romance mm -hmm. is always reflecting the times we live in. Westerns, very, very set, very uh, old fashioned kind of characters, male characters. Uh, there's one guy who does Westerns and who dominates Westerns. His name is William Johnstone. He is, unfortunately, he, uh, he passed away several years ago, but uh, somebody's continuing to write those stories. It's, uh, they sell very well at Walmart and really no place else. So wow. it's, a, it's an old fashioned down market category that does really well in mass market. So people who buy them tend to buy them at a very low price format and they tend to buy them by brand. So you've got William Johnson, who's the number one, and everybody else is writing Westerns. They're way down there. Nobody, nobody comes even close to what he sells. So it's a very, very picky category. And it seems like it's a category where one very popular author is probably more than enough to fill people's needs. Although yeah. maybe there's something going on there. Hey, if it's selling well at Walmart, I will always want to take a look at one and see whether I could try to make inroads there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and people are trying to give you the name of the author who has books featuring a black boy. So someone said Rebecca Weatherspoon and someone said oh, yeah. Jackson. It's, it's, I think that's the Cowboys of California or something like that. Am I correct? Somebody I, tell me if I'm correct or not. Yes, that's <laughs> absolutely. Got it. All right, so we are gonna move on to our next category, which is, um, I love this question too, because I hear it often, women's fiction. Can you please define women's fiction? In researching agents, Publishers Marketplace has a women's romance category, but those agents seem skewed to romance. While my novel wouldn't have a pink cover with shoes and a purse, it has a female protagonist, two other female POV characters, friendship conflicts, personal growth. It seems women's fiction-y, but it's not romance. I don't know how to pitch it. 
What's so with, it's what's about romance. Yeah. yeah. So romance is, it's really focused on the romantic relationship and there's always a happily ever after. Women's fiction is about women's lives. So they tend to have at least one female protagonist. They can have two or three. They can be sisters. They can be mother, daughter. They can be best friends. And it focuses on their lives and the issues they're dealing with in their lives. There could be a romantic uh, uh, subplot, but it's a subplot. It's not the main portion. It's not the main focus of the book. It's really about the, the, the woman and her development through the book and how she deals with the issues that's facing her. Some women's fiction, I mean, big, big women's fiction, I would say, is like Kristen Hanna with The Nightingale. A lot of the World War II women's fiction that's really big, like Lilac Girls. We have our own book, The Paris Seamstress. Uh, those are women's fiction because they're about women's lives, but they're not about the romance. That's not the number one focus of it. It's really about women's relationships, family dynamics, and about character development and character growth. And if it's women's fiction, you say it's women's fiction. It's a very well-known category to publishers. It's a big, big, big category. And just say it's women's fiction. And agents know what that is. Publishers and editors know what that is. It's a... Yeah, go ahead. I think this could be a great category for comparison titles because it is such a broad, meaning if you're talking about your own work, finding somebody who's writing something in the same sort of space in the women's fiction category might be a helpful way to let an agent know immediately what it is that, uh, that you're writing. So finding those comparisons. This is why Becca is so smart because <laughs> Comparison titles are so important to publishing. It's an easy way of positioning what this book's read is like, who the audience is for this book. And if you know this book is going to appeal to Jojo Moyes um, um, readers, you know exactly who the buyer at Barnes and Noble to sell it to because it's the one who bought Jojo Moyes. Yeah. They're always spending a lot of time looking at comp titles. Yeah. Well, and that also might be a way to find the agents. You know, if what you're if you're doing searches and you're finding women's, you're doing an if you're doing the search under women slash romance, I'm wondering if it's more that publishers marketplace is putting most of their deals, putting mostly romance deals under that category. And you might have to go into fiction and see and just look for stories that are women's fiction within the general fiction of publisher, publishers marketplace. That would be one thought too. Um, but look at the agents for those, for those authors who are on that shelf and see if they might be a fit for you. Yeah, when all bookstores are open again, it's a great reason to go and browse. Look at your favorite books, the ones that you think are a perfect comparison for your book that you're writing. And yeah, looking the book is usually in the acknowledgements at the end. They'll tend to say who their, uh, who their agent is or sometimes on their website, they will do that too. They will say that. Yeah. Okay. So um, here's another question about women's fiction. What is the market for fiction written for women aged 50 and above about issues and concerns they would have? So what is the market for the, as our um, former board member and a wonderful author here in Austin would say, the um, marvelously mature. <laughs> I love that, marvelously mature. I'll have to remember that. <laughs> I don't know when the last time this question came up at an editorial meeting. I don't know if that means that we're not getting submissions for women age 50 and above or uh, people just aren't interested in writing books for women age 50 and above, but really fiction, okay. First of all, let me, okay, let, let me approach it this way. A lot of the fiction we get are, tend to have characters who are 50 and under. And I think the reason for that is, and this is just strictly my, my thinking on it, is that when we publish a book, we want to have the book, to, we want the book to appeal to as wide an audience as possible. We know that millennials will tend to read up only to a certain age, whereas people who are older, 50 and above, will read characters who are older than they are and much younger than, than they are. I know a lot of women who are over 50 who will read YA. So women, older women tend to be much, much more open about the characters who they're reading about, whereas the younger readers tend to read only up to about, I, I, probably characters who are in the 40 and then they, they're, just, they're just not interested. Right. So that, that kind of uh, gives you an insight into why a lot of books that are written tend to have younger protagonists. But there are plenty of books 
for women age 50. As I said, women age 50 read across all genres, all age groups. So every time I republish a book, any of the books that you've seen here, I always feel like, oh, there's, there's a woman over 50 who's going to want to read that, especially romance readers who identify as romance readers. I mean, we're talking age ranges of like 87 to, to 15. The same thing for mystery, the same thing for thrillers, the same thing for science fiction and fantasy. Well, and I would think that, you know, and I hope that everyone realizes this too, that there's always the sort of exception to what's what's normally happening in the editorial meeting, meaning, you know, a book like Bridges of Madison County, which is a great example in many ways because of the subject matter. And, you know, if you had sort of said, hey, would you be interested in a book set in, you know, Iowa about a romance between an older man photographer and an older woman, you know, housewife. Um, but that book set itself apart for many reasons. So I think that there is, there it's, you can find that one or two books that might beat the market, but it's not going to be, it's going to be tough and you're going to want to have your stuff together and have written a really great book. Terry McMillan's newest book that was published in March 20, I actually wrote it down because I knew I wasn't going to remember its name, its title. It's called, It's Not All Down Here, Downhill From Here. The <laughs> protagonist is a female who's 68 years old. Wow. I love yeah. it. That's awesome. Yeah. Go Terry McMillan. And I remember uh, years and years ago, I was trying to find the name of it. The title was something like Juliet and Romeo. It was a play on Romeo and Juliet and the characters were in their yeah. 60s. And that was a huge, huge bestseller. People the love story, so right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We ourselves, I wouldn't call it genre fiction, but we published a series of books about uh, an 87 year old man named Hendrik Grohn and his hijinks in this, uh, this, this home he lives in. They are so, so funny. Uh, Richard Bachman's book, uh, A Man Called Ova, that's, uh, that features a, a, an, old, an old gentleman who who finds new meaning in life and he opens his life up to uh, to the people around him. So it's it's just about finding the characters who will really resonate with people, starting with an agent, starting with an editor, and just people just fall in love with them regardless of their age. I think that book was called Julie and Romeo, but I can't. Oh, there wrong. you go. I think that's what it was called. I love it. Okay, great. So here are a couple books in this category that were examples that you sent to us. I think you mentioned the Paris Seamstress and um, and then we have the beautiful like red cover. I love this, Miss Scarlet School of Patternless Sewing. <laughs> Anything you wanna say about these before we go, go to the next category? Yes, I picked these two especially for a reason. One thing about genre fiction is that Editors and publishers love looking at what's selling and trying to figure out what is a hot category. What can we buy and publish in that category? First and Hannah's The Nightingale was a huge, huge, huge bestseller. And then Lilac Girls, which is about women's fiction, women's fiction set during World War II. Very, very, just very uh, emotionally charged, very, uh, very dynamic book that's just, that's so hundreds of thousands of copies so we realized oh my god this is a great category we should publish in and we found this book by natasha lester who was originally published in the in australia set in paris during world war ii and we published it in 2018 and it became a huge bestseller for us so if you're interested in genre fiction always keep an eye for what seems to be selling look at the new york times list you could look at the usa today list just listen to what people are talking about. And if it's a category that you're interested in, I say, guess, just go write it, guess, write it right away, finish it and send it to an agent. <laughs> Miss Scarlet School of Patternless Sewing is by an author named Kathy Condemarillo. And um, Becca was talking about uh, um, uh, people of color in publishing. And one of the things that we realize lately because think because of the black lives matter movement is that publishing is behind where we need to be in terms of diversity so everybody in editorial departments all, all all in all publishing houses are looking for diversity authors and we are very very proud at, at grand center we, that we publish we're very inclusive we publish diversity authors but there's always room for more diversity authors and i know agents are looking for diversity authors writing across a whole a whole range too so it's a great opportunity. Do you take uh, direct submissions from authors, uh, writers of color, or are you looking for those to come from agents? 
for our romance imprint forever, we are actually going to be opening up an open box where we'll be taking unagented submissions, especially from diversity authors, because we really want them. Everything else, we go through agents. Yeah. So find yourself an agent. <laughs> Easy. And then just write a book really fast. <laughs> All right. Uh, mystery, thriller, horror is our next category we're going to go into. So do publishers, I love this question because I remember these anthologies when I worked at St. Martin's and Warner. Do publishers do anthologies anymore? I'm thinking specifically short story or novella, crime fiction and horror. If so, how are submissions handled? We publish anthologies, but on a very limited basis because they tend to sell smaller quantities. We love anthologies by authors who are uh, best-selling authors already because then you already have a built-in fan base. And you know that even though that book is going to sell lower than their full-length novels, it would still be a nice enough um, number of copies that it's worth it. For a brand new author, it, they're going to have to be spectacular, spectacular short stories and novellas. And one of the things we'll probably ask is, does the author have a novel? Because <laughs> if you were to buy from a brand new author or an author with a very limited track record, we would want to know that there's a novel coming along because the novel is where we feel our best shot is. We have an author named Lisa Cross Smith who has had two literary commercial novels that have been published by small houses. They did really well for those small houses, but when we're talking small houses, we're talking like 2,000 copies sell, which is big for a small house, but but, but small for a big house like Grand Center Publishing. She came to us with a collection of short stories, a collection of new short stories and previously published short stories. We fell in love with those short stories. So we bought the short stories. We published them in an anthology called uh, So We Can Glow, but we bought it knowing that there was a novel coming and we're publishing that novel next summer. So there is, but we're very, very selective about them. So what about, though, do you have an idea for how someone gets a story in an anthology that's a collection of, of multiple writers? So, and um, Jetta put in the chat, I just picked up Alabama Noir. It's fantastic. I believe that's Akashic Publishing has been doing um, these noir collections of sort of, you know, noir stories based on a particular city or a state or a town, what have you. But what about, I know in the romance world, especially there, uh, there used to be at least a lot of anthologies. And I'm just wondering if you have any tips for how writers get into those in the first place. Is it just knowing the authors who are pulling them together? Because those are usually pulled together by authors, right? I would say try to get your short stories published in journals. And if you're, if you're a mystery writer, ah, gosh, Ellery, Ellery Queen, I'm assuming they're still publishing, getting them into those kinds of publications that publish short stories, getting them in journals, getting them in, in any place that will publish short stories. And then you establish your credibility so that when it comes time for you to figure out if you can be in an anthology with other authors, you already have that kind of credibility. If you're writing genre fiction, I would suggest belonging to an organization that specializes in that category like Mystery Writers of America, like Romance Writers of America. And I know science fiction has one too. And establishing a network, getting to know people. And there's so much that happens in publishing. It's all about networking, knowing who people are, Knowing, uh, knowing the right person so that when an opportunity comes along, they think, oh, I know this person who would be fantastic with this anthology. Let's talk to that person and see if they want to contribute. That's a great suggestion just in general for anyone in genre fiction is to join whatever organization you can that is bringing writers together um, in that category, for sure. Um, you, know I write also, you, you know what also might be helpful, especially because there's no barrier to publishing anymore because of ebooks. Everybody can self-publish. If you really love your short story or your no or your novella, why don't you try self-publishing it? See if that works, and then and then once your book has once your novella has racked up how however however many reviews like hundreds of, of reviews and your rating is four point five on an Amazon, and then you end up publishing three or four of these five novellas. It's a kind of thing where you could approach an agent and say, look, I've got this track record of my self-published books. Look at the wonderful reviews. Look at the sales I've had. Are you interested? Anything like that to establish your credibility. 
I love it. Um, I write dark police procedurals. My publisher is now focusing more on cozies and contemporary gone girl type thrillers and less on police stories. Can you discuss my options if the publisher declines to publish my third novel in a series? This is a tough but great question. Yeah. Um, this is something we deal with all the time. Police procedurals have been going down in popularity and this is what I hear from my sales reps and from the accounts. The big box stores, Targets, Walmarts, Costco's, BJ's, Sam's, they're having a harder time the past couple of years than before selling police procedurals, especially if they're written by male authors about male protagonists. I think it has to do with our customer base. May I'm, I'm assuming most, their typical customer base is female and so maybe they're not as attracted to those kinds of books especially when there's all this wonderful women's fiction for them to read that seem to be much much more relatable at a glance because of the kind of cover because of the back cover because of the description of the book so i can definitely see why your publisher may be focusing more on cozies and and and, and the gone girl type thrillers the psychological suspense what are your options there are plenty of publishers that's the one thing is that we always talk about the big five publishers in New York, you know, Simon & Schuster, Macmillan, us, PRH, which is just one giant empire. But outside of that, there are so many small publishers, there are regional publishers, there are so many, so many opportunities for an author to be published. I say, go look at every single one of those and see which one would be interested in publishing your book, or you can always, always self-publish. That I would never ever dissuade anybody from self-publishing because we've seen how ebook self-publishing just revolutionized that whole industry. So you've got plenty of options. If you find a publisher who will be very interested in publishing your third novel, you are absolutely within your rights to sell that third novel. The publisher who, uh, who previously published those two books own the rights to those two books. They don't own the rights to your character. There are plenty of authors who jump ship from house to house within in, in the middle of a series, and that's perfectly fine. For example, Robert Ludlum, his Born series, they started at Bantam, and then they moved to St. Martin's, and then I think Valentine's publishing them now. He moved Jason Bourne around. Nobody can stop you from doing that. <laughs> no one can stop Jason Bourne from doing anything. Oh, and we published Jason Bourne for about three or four books, so there you go. <laughs> so uh, what would you as an editor what would be most helpful to you if someone came to you with a third novel um in a series the most important thing is your track record i would want to know if this is the third novel in the series i need to know what the sales track is of the first two books if they are interesting enough to me then i would say well let me take a look at the third novel and, and let's see if we can publish it if the two novels sales were soft by our standards then i would want to see how well reviewed those books were how what kind of ratings they have on goodreads what kind of ratings they have on on, uh, on amazon and i would probably dip into a few chapters of each book and see if the writing the feel is really is is really strong and i would be very interested in working with an author like that but if a track record is soft, I would very likely go to that author and say, maybe we should try something else. So that it's almost like a blank slate, start a new series, or let's, let's think about something different altogether. It's like, it's, the idea is I would want to work with the author and let's figure out a way to make this author publishable by my publisher. Got it. Okay. So our next question. Oh, and you wanted to recommend uh, Texas writers, Sandra Brown. Absolutely. And one of these days we're going to get her to do an appearance for you guys. I would love it. I would love it. Okay. Well, everybody knows Sandra Brown, but she is someone who I think is an interesting person to talk about in genre fiction because she did start in romance and now she really is just a huge thriller force, right? So she kind of left her, um, her initial roots behind. Is that correct? She is one of the grand dames of romance. She started writing in the early 80s. Those category romances we were talking about, she used to write those very like 35,000 words, 40,000 words. And I know because we, we bought the rights of those books and we published them still. So mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of our backlist. And um, 
as she kept writing and writing, she kept wanting to expand the kind of story that she wanted to, she wanted to say, she wanted to write about. And at a certain point, it was in the early 90s when a lot of these very successful romance authors who were very interested in writing uh, suspense and were incorporating suspense in their books became these found publishers who wanted to take the risk of publishing these authors not as romance authors, but as suspense authors, and not just category, but breaking them out into hardcovers. And Sandra Brown was one of the first authors to make that leap. And that was like 25 years ago. And, and she's been writing a book every year since then, of this wonderful blend <coughs> of suspense, but there's always a romance element in her books. So she's never left behind her romance roots. There's always a wonderful relationship between the, the heroine and the hero, and it's, it's, it's a great mashup of suspense and romance. And so when we, uh, we have the pleasure of, uh, of publishing her, so when we publish her, we market her to suspense, but we also never forget her romance readers. So we do a lot of outreach to romance uh, bloggers, romance websites to make sure that her romance fans from long ago remember that she's got a new book. I love it. Thank you. All right. Psychological, and I added slash domestic suspense. Are you interested in domestic suspense for your publishing house? And if your publishing house isn't interested in domestic suspense, can you name some others <laughs> who might be? So I'm guessing that, I mean, domestic, domestic suspense, first of all, can you just define that? What is domestic suspense? Domestic suspense, well, I think domestic really uh, defines what it is. It tends to be about families, it's not suspense the way Jason Bourne is suspense. That's, that's more espionage. Big, big, big stage. You got, uh, you got spies. And uh, it's not like a James Patterson suspense novel where the hero is an FBI agent and he's dealing with these, these, these villains who want to control the world. Domestic suspense is about regular people like you and me and all the horrible things that happen in their lives. So it's much, much more relatable that way. And that's what we call the domestic suspense. Domestic suspense became a huge category when Gone Girl came out all those years ago. And then everybody thought, oh, you know what? That kind of suspense, it's going to last for a little bit and then it's going to die. And then Girl on the Train came out and it just hasn't lost its hold on people. You look at the suspense list, you've got Ruth Ware, you've got Megan Miranda, you've got Lisa Jewell, you've got all these authors who are just writing amazing domestic suspense year after year, book after book. And even though it's a glutted market, editors are the most optimistic people. We're always looking for the one that we think, oh, this will stand out above the rest. This is the one that we can go to a cast and say, this is gonna be the gone girl of next year. This is gonna be the, the girl on the train of 2022. So in domestic suspense, it really is about finding a new twist to your setup because there have been so many books and we've seen the same kind of setups, the same kind of plot twists over and over and over again. We're always looking for something new. The silent patient is domestic suspense. It's not mm -hmm. about espionage. It's not about spies. It's about this, this, this doctor treating this, this patient. And there's an amazing twist at the end and we're always looking for that thing that makes you go, oh my God, this is something I've never seen before. We can go to the accounts and say, this is special and look what a huge bestseller that is. And domestic suspense is even more important than, than, the, than, in, um, than, than ever to make sure the book is the best it can be. That you are as unique in writing in this blooded market as possible. So the answer would be yes, you are in domestic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are in every single house Big and small is interested in domestic suspense. We are always <laughs> looking for that new new twist. We have a, we're publishing a, an author who's been published by a small house, very well reviewed, just has won tons of awards, small house. So we're publishing her first book for us, it's domestic suspense. And I'll just give you just a quick take on, on what the plot is to see if you can get a sense of what it is we're looking for. Uh, there's a home invasion and the husband becomes so paranoid that he installs this incredible security system in his house. And he starts to, oh, and also becomes, uh, uh, um, he's so injured, he becomes a, uh, um, he's, um, a paraplegic, yes, sorry. And so he's, it's like rear window, and his window into the world are these security systems that he's placed throughout his house and outside in his yard. 
and he starts noticing some weird things that his wife is doing. So he starts to think maybe, for some weird reason, he starts to think that maybe his wife was the one behind the home invasion, or maybe not. So it, uh, it's about privacy in this digital world. It's about who's telling the truth. Is there such a thing as truth, or it's all just a matter of what we're perceiving at that moment? So I, I we have found that, uh, that set up very, very interesting. And Girl Last Scene was something we published in the trade paperback original. Um, Six years ago, when we first published this book, our first print, what we printed was 17,000 copies, which was really good at that time. And it's now been a bestseller for us for three years. We've now shipped about close to 300,000 copies of this book. Hmm. Girl is still really good as a title. Gun Girl, Girl on the Train, it still works. You think, oh my God, aren't people going to get sick and tired of growing the title? It still works, I tell you. It's a, wow. unbelievable how it works. And this but is there about has it. to be a girl in the book, right? There has to be a girl <laughs> in the book, yes. We've tried with daughter, we've tried with sister, we've tried with, well, not cousin, but <laughs> we've tried all sorts of different uh, combinations so that not every single book is a girl. And uh, they perform to a certain level, but I'm telling you, girl is just, it's a magic word. Still. Yeah. Um, all right. So science fiction fantasy. I'm midway through writing my first sci-fi fantasy novel um, and would like to begin to send submissions and queries to agents and through them to publishers. However, I've heard that one needs to have the novel completed before queries and submissions. Why is that? Okay. I am reading this question in terms of my first sci-fi fantasy novel. I'm just taking that to mean that this is you, uh, you've never published before. This is uh, so you don't have a track record. So one of the things, one of the, re there, are set, there are a couple of reasons why we want to see a complete manuscript. If you've never been published before, your agent and the editor needs to know that you can actually finish a book. There's a, I don't know how many of you have started projects and never finished it. Like when I was in high school, I thought, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to sew a skirt. Never finished a single skirt. Never, not one. <laughs> so we need to know that you have what it takes to actually sit down and write a book from word one all the way to the end. Number two, if it's genre fiction, I talked about how it's always good to see what's hot, what's a trending category, and try to write in that category if it's a category that you like. And if you submit just a proposal to a hot category, while the agent will be interested, the agent will want to know, well, by the time I get this complete manuscript from this author, because it's a first-time novelist, I'll never be able to sell it on a proposal, how long will it take for this author to finish this? And by the time this author finishes this manuscript, will that trend already be gone? Will it have moved on to something else? And then suddenly the agent and you have a book that's no longer as hot as it once was. So it's all about proving that you can finish a manuscript. It's all about timing. And also, sometimes, we never ever buy a first novel, very, very, very rarely buy a first novel from a proposal, because you really want to see how the author is able to carry it through to the end. And, um, and sometimes, this happens, sometimes you read a whole manuscript, and oh my god, it's so good, and every editor around town is reading it, it's a complete manuscript, it's so good you're probably going to get a nice bidding war. On a proposal, you're probably going to get editors who are excited by it, but are a little cautious because who knows if the, edit, if the author is going to be able to finish this. So while they may bid on your book, the amount may be lower than if it were a complete manuscript. So it's really to your, to your benefit to finish that manuscript first. All right. And I think most agents also will really want a full manuscript when you're querying them, to be honest, but I'm sure that might be a little less rigid for them. Okay. I write spiritually inspired, family-friendly fantasy adventures. That is a lot of categories. Um, among other things, yet there is no genre that really fits this. Regular fantasy doesn't fit as I look up books that go along with fantasy. How can I find the right genre fit for my books? And I think this is, I want to hear what you think about this specific question, but I also think this is something that folks struggle with when they feel like they they don't have a defined, there's no defined category for what they're writing. 
when we read spiritually inspired, we feel that's code for Christian. So if the question is, it's a Christian fantasy, I actually did some research. I just went on Google and I said, and I just looked at Christian publishers and there's Zondervan, there's a, a, oh my gosh, my brain is gone. But there are a whole host of Christian publishers. I went on websites of a couple and I typed in, and search, I typed in fantasy and there were a whole bunch of fantasy novels that came up. So if you're writing Christian fantasy, then you have a lot of options. Just do your research just like I did and you'll be able to find places that will take it. If it's not Christian, then it's just a matter for us to try to figure out how much of that spiritual element comes across as Christian or can it be read by a mainstream audience? I'm not saying not Christian, I'm saying mainstream audience. So it's really about the read. And in that case, if you're submitting to a place like Grand Central, which is a mainstream publisher, then I would, I would stress the fantasy. And uh, if there's a, a spiritual element to it, then you can just say with a spiritual element. Yeah, because the Christian, the Christian fiction publishing world is a really different world. I mean, in terms of a lot of the marketing that they're going to do, some of the bookstores that they're going to sell to. So, and talk about expectations. There's also a real expectation that books are going to fit, um, that are, they're going to align with whatever, um, whatever the house expects in terms of their fiction. And so, um, yeah, that is a different, a whole different thing than necessarily if you're writing spiritually inspired something that's every, not Christian. every single big publisher they have a they will tend to have a separate sales force that sells the christian market because it's completely separate from uh, from the what we call the regular trade publishing the more mainstream publishing so you really need to have somebody who's an expert in that in that christian market who can sell your book properly to that market and there and are agents also I that don't, specialize yeah yeah, and I, it's, it's not a, a category I'm very familiar with, but you can do your research the way I did, and I think you'll be happy with what you see. Does Hachette Book Group still have Faith Words? Is that Yes, we on? do. We have Faith Words, we have Center Street, but they don't do fiction anymore. Or if they do fiction, it's a very, very limited basis. They are really focusing more on nonfiction. Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, T.D. Jakes. Yeah, okay. I hope that answers the question. No, I think you just gave a lot of great tips and um, and some thoughts too. And again, going back to comparison titles, I think you want to try your best to just find a book that has been published that might sort of speak to what you're trying to say in terms of what your book is. Um, yeah, again, browse your bookstore or you can go to their website, just like I did of those Christian publishers and take a look and see what they've published. And what I saw in terms of fantasy, I saw fantasies for adults and I saw YA fantasies. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, there's a lot of options for you. So good for you. Um, science fiction uh, recommend Octavia Butler, who we all we all adore. Um, what did you want to say about this book? I just saw the chat from I think it was Michelle who said I love Octavia Butler. Yay! 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 Thank you. Uh, we have been publishing Octavia Butler since the 1990s, and I'm so 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 proud that uh, that we have her on our list. To me. She is like the, like Ursula Le Guin. She is the uber grand dame when it comes to alternative fiction. And what I, and because of the success of Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale when it was on, uh, on, on TV as a streaming series, there has been this newfound appreciation of Octavia Butler, not just because of how powerful her words are, but because when she was writing back in the 90s, she was envisioning a future that is actually now. Parable of the Sower is book one of a series and book two, Parable of the Talents. She actually has a politician in there whose logo is something like Make America Great Again. She wrote that back in the 90s. And yeah. uh, we've been, as I said, we've been publishing those books within, in 19, since 1990. And we are in a, 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 a program right now where we're taking all of our titles and we're reissuing them with new covers. And all these people are talking about how great Octavia Butler is from um, John Green. John Green is talking about how great she is, and the New York Times is writing about how great she is. So it's just so wonderful to see this resurgence of interest in, in a legendary author. Do you know and, that? Uh, okay. uh, Bye, Pop. 
What? Bypass. Bypass. <laughs> You know, she has a, a mountain um, on Pluto named after her, one of the moons of Pluto. Oh. And an, ast an asteroid? I don't know. Comet? Anyways, she's awesome. Um, here's so then we had questions that would fit under sort of a more general, um, whether genre fiction or we have some questions that are not really specific to genre fiction that we will still throw your way. So, how strong is today's market for genre fiction? Well, I actually did some research because Becky was kind enough to send me some of the questions a little earlier today. I was able to go on. There's a, there is a resource for publishers and a lot of people called BookScan. They, every week, they aggregate sales from a whole bunch of book retailers across the country, from Target, from indie stores, um, from Barnes & Noble, and they put that up on their website so we can see how our books sold, number of units sold compared to other people's units. So it's, it's a very competitive thing. So I was looking, and here's what I found out. So even in this strange and difficult times we live in right now, through, through July, middle of July, the mystery detective and suspense thriller category is up. This is 1%, but it's up 1%, and it sold 16.7 million units this year. The romance genre is up 1.3% and it's sold 9.3 million units so far this year. Sci-fi fantasy is, I'm sorry to say it's down 4%, but it's still sold 5.5 million units. If you add those up, those are the three, there are more categories of genre fiction, but those are the, those are the biggest categories. If you add those up, that's 31.5 million units sold just in July alone. If you compare that to the general fiction category, the general fiction category sold 24 million. So I think that tells you how strong today's market is for genre fiction. Wow, that's pretty cool. Thanks for the, and that yeah. was in July alone? No, no, no. Up to <laughs> July. <laughs> who's, who's buying that many books in July? <laughs> From January through July. Oh, and don't forget, there are self-published eBooks that's not captured by book scans. So if you count all those self-published ebooks and mystery and romance, that those units are even bigger. And you know, we're we've talked about um, ebooks a little bit tonight, but I think that is something that for you know, it's one thing to say to someone who's writing a literary novel, just go self-publish it. People are doing it every day, but but for genre, it really like the successes in the ebook original self-publishing world are largely coming from genre fiction writers. Oh my God, absolutely. Um, there was a time when, when, um, when self-publishing became the hot new thing in what, 2013, 2014, lots and lots of big publishers were looking and seeing what was popping up on Amazon's bestseller list. We look at Amazon all the time. And people started buying all these self-published authors. We ourselves bought Jody Allen Malpas, whose first book for us became a number one New York Times bestseller based on the strength of her self-published books. And um, they not only revolutionized how people can publish books, but they, because they're self-publishing, they were so savvy about how to market their books. To this day, we pay attention to what self-published authors do when it comes to marketing. And we try to see what we can do that can work for us. So yeah. it's, it's, it's just, it's always, a, it's always a very, very good thing to be looking at because they're always doing something new. It's always exciting and you never know what's going to be bubbling up from the self-published category that could turn out to be the next big thing. Yeah. Cool. Um, in today's writing market, is it absolutely necessary to have an agent in order to find a publisher in one's chosen genre? If you want to be published by big five publishers, and I mentioned what they are, yes, absolutely. Um, beyond that, every house has its own guideline, has its own rule. So if you're interested in publishing without an agent, you're going to probably have to go to a big five, outside of the big five publisher, and then I would just go online and look up small publishers and see what their guidelines are. Every once in a while, big publishers will have a writing contest or they'll have an open box submissions thing the way we are the way we are uh, at Grand Central Publishing but but yeah and most editors at a big five publisher 
really want to work with an agent because publishing is such a complex process. It's always helpful to have an agent to, to help explain things, to help things along with, a, with, an, with, a, with an editor. And also, uh, because we see so many submissions, we rely on agents to kind of be our first readers. If a trusted agent says, oh, this is a really good book, then we pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Um, should an unpublished new author write to the markets or write their own story that may not fit into editors and agents want lists? What is your I, answer to this? <laughs> you should write what excites you. Absolutely. Do not, do not write what you think the market will buy because I think that that comes out. We can, it's, I think, I think editors can see if an author is writing in a fake way because they think this is what, what the, what the editor is going to want. This is what the reader is going to want. Write what you want to write, write what you feel passionate about, write what's going to make you, what's going to make you wake up at five o'clock in the morning and find half an hour to write before you have to take care of the kids, before you have to go off to work, before you have to go do all your stuff. The thing about writing what you want to write is that I think you just need to be careful about what your expectations are. If it's a, if you happen to be writing in a big category, then okay, maybe you can have big expectations. If you're writing in a, if you're starting a brand new category all on your own, it may not be the kind of book that will sell in big numbers, but maybe that's just a start for you. I think it's the most important thing for an author to write what they want to write, to love what they want to write, because writing is so hard and the publishing process is so hard at the very, very least, you should love sitting in front of your laptop or on your legal pad writing, writing longhand and enjoying what you're actually putting down. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, I really like this question. Have you ever had a disagreement with an author about the genre of his or her novel? What were the issues and the outcome? Oh, yeah. And if you want to name names, you're welcome to. <laughs> Or if you've just had a great disagreement with an author that had nothing to do with genre, we would love to hear that as well. <laughs> I'm not gonna name names, but we had a, we bought an, um, a, a book by a best-selling author and uh, one, one book, but big, big best-selling author. And uh, this book is psychological suspense, horror, horror in that it's kind of like that Stranger Things if you watch that on, uh, on Netflix. It very much has that vibe. So we wanted it to position it as that kind of a book and, you know, not position it as a, oh, it's very category um, horror, blood and guts, but a very sophisticated, big, big, big kind of horror suspense novel. And because the author's background was in that one big book that the author had was literary fiction, the author really wanted it positioned that way. And this author was big enough had enough clout that we ended up saying, okay. And it worked up to a certain level, not the way we really had hoped it would, but for the paperback, we are positioning it very squarely for that upmarket horror reader, like the Justin Cronin kind of reader, the, the, the reader who would, uh, who would be, be watching Stranger Things. So we lost the battle in the first format in the hardcover, but we won the battle in the, in the paperback format and we'll see which sells better. And then we can decide who really is the winner. <laughs> so um, who, the, who the winner is, a lot of it depends on how powerful the agent is, how powerful the author is, or how persuasive the author is in, in, um, in saying, no, it's gotta be positioned this way because of this and this and this and this and this. And the author could bring up points that the editor and the publisher hadn't thought about. And then he'll be like, oh my God, absolutely, you're right. Or we really feel very strongly that this is what it needs to be. And uh, we hope that we can persuade the author and the agent. I would expect though that often genre has been, that conversation about genre has probably happened between the author and the agent before the agent actually submits the book to the publishing house, because oftentimes, not in this case, obviously with a huge, you know, a best-selling author who is just coming in to probably the publisher and you, and you know, you're deciding whether or not to buy it, but it's going to a specific editor who mostly edits romance or mostly edits mystery or might be like, they kind of 
have that conversation, would that be true that usually by the time you're seeing a book, the genre has been established? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's always so good to have a person in your corner, like an agent, to help you figure that out before the agent goes out with a submission. And then sometimes, though, even if it's a, a very well-respected agent and we absolutely understand the agent's point of view about why this is a particular genre, we could still have our own point of view. And sometimes it could really be very opportunistic. Let's say that, oh, the, the agent says, this is a horror novel, and we feel, you know what? We think we can sell more if we classify it as a suspense novel, and we can completely justify calling it suspense instead of horror this way. And right now, suspense is selling much better than horror, so we feel that that's a much bigger market. If you sell it to BNN, the BNN buyer for suspense is, is um, what they can buy of a book would be higher than what they can buy of a horror novel. So sometimes it's that way. It's what we think will let us sell the book in a bigger way. So it can be very, very, very uh, business oriented that way as opposed to just what a wonderful book. Well, and it kind of goes back to where we started, which was marketing, you know, yeah. genre for marketing. <laughs> exactly. I love this. So we had a few questions about um, the same sort of topic. Where does absurd humor like Woodhouse, Pratchett, Adams, or Americans, Christopher Moore, Carl Hyacin, Tom Robbins fit in? Are publishers open to humor right now? These are such difficult times. Is there any point in submitting funny projects to acquiring editors or agents? And do you know any agents or houses who are open to absurdist humor? So um, where does the humor, where, where, I think it's such a great question because I think of that, I'm a huge Carl Hyacin fan, but I'm not sure where Carl Hyacin, I assume he's, he's shelved under mystery or thriller, but yeah, you know. He is. he is, because there's always a mystery in the book. So humor, humor works really, really well for nonfiction because you've got all these uh, established comedians writing who, who will write books like, you know, Jerry Seinfeld all those years ago, Paul Reiser. We, uh, we, uh, there's Jim Gaffigan, we had Chelsea Handler, we published it at Grand Central. So, so humor, nonfiction humor is a very well-established category and it can sell and sell and sell like Kevin Hart. Humor in novel is a much, much more difficult category and we will tend to try to figure out if there's a different category we can put it in like Carl Hyacin. Tom Robbins would be, would be fiction. We mm -hmm. won't say humor, it'll be fiction. Woodhouse, I love, love, love Woodhouse. And he's fiction. Pratchett, I think, um, sometimes he's, 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 a, he's considered a, a fantasy writer. Um, so there, there are, and humor is so subjective. Where does Christopher Moore go? Do you know where Christopher Moore goes? He must be just general fiction, right? He must be general fiction. Also, he started in YA, right? And YA yeah. is not something I, I really know since I, I published, but I, I publish adults. But most humorous novels are just published as general fiction. Mm -hmm. And the humor is, oh my God, look, and it's also funny. <laughs> yeah, and it's helpful to have those comparison humor titles to sort of let someone know that that's what the voice of the book is. But um, it's also hard when you're writing a pitch letter or a query letter to say, this is really funny because you as the author saying that you're going to, you will not be able to stop laughing when you read this, Beth, you know, um, or when you're pitching an agent. So I think sometimes the humor doesn't even go first. It's more about what is the story? What is the point of view? Who is the character? And then, you know, if it's funny, you can figure out a way to, to mention that in a subtle way. The, the, the one category where humor, well, where humor is really expected is obviously romantic comedies, because you've got the comedy already in the category. So you expect that to be funny. Yeah. Um, so... Do you find that mixed genres, fiction with nonfiction, and even some poetry is hard to place with a publisher? Wow, I, I think if, if you have me on video, you probably saw me frowning because that's really difficult. We were talking about mashups, is it a horror, is it suspense? The same thing with this kind of thing. Fiction with nonfiction, it's hard for me to imagine what that is. It's the kind of thing where I would have to look at it and see how mm -hmm. well it works. So it comes with challenges. Poetry, it's okay. I think poetry is not that weird with fiction because why not? Um, 
it, it's uh, like a, a novel, and then there's a, a couple of pages where you've got uh, one of the characters writing a letter, and there's the whole letter in there. Mix genres always will raise a lot of um, raise a lot of questions, and it makes it a little bit more difficult for an editor to figure out what to do with that book. But again, you know, if it's wonderful, hopefully it will find the right editor and hopefully it will find the right audience. It just makes it more challenging for you to figure out who would publish this book and how should that book be published properly. And you know, I, 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 usually, I think of fiction and nonfiction actually as, and you know, this is, this is just terms, but I think of them as categories. And I think like crossing categories in that way is a different thing than crossing genres within fiction, you know, which is kind of exactly what you just said. Like you would expect genres within fiction to cross, but fiction and nonfiction crossing sounds, sounds tough. I think you'd have to see what, yeah, you would need to know what that project was. Um, oh, I skipped. Um, if you write, so this is an interesting question that is not so much about genre, but I thought it would be helpful maybe for you to speak to this. If you write a piece of fiction in English, but in some passages you let your characters speak in their native language, in this case, Wolof or Fulani, how would you categorize this, categorize this genre? Do you suggest translating into English the ideas of the characters speaking in their native language? So. And I know that the person who wrote this question was thinking to some books that they had read where there was English and Spanish, and they found that the Spanish portion of it, because they didn't speak Spanish, sort of kept them at arm's length. And so they're wondering, you know, as an editor, how you kind of think about this in books that you work on or when you're talking to writers, that idea of including another language that probably um, there's a good chance that the majority of readers aren't going to speak. Another language I think adds a nice flavor to, to the book, but you have to be very, very careful with how much of it is in there. Whenever I edit a book or we publish a book where there is a different language than English, if it's one word or two and you can figure out in context what it is, then we wouldn't uh, include what it means in English. If it's a sentence and you really can't figure out that easily what it is in context, then usually what we would do is probably put after that sentence in parentheses what the English uh, translation of that is. But every time you do that, you are stopping the reader from being fully lost in your novel so that they, they have to figure out what is this word? What is the sentence? What does it mean? Oh, here's, here's the definition of it. So you, that's why you have to be very, very, very careful. If you're going to use a different language, it would be really useful if you use words that are probably already very familiar to, a, to an English, English speaker so they can read it without it taking it away from, the, from being fully immersed in your novel. And how would I categorize a genre? It's just whatever that genre is. It could be if it's a romantic comedy with some Spanish, then it's romantic comedy. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, in some ways this makes me think of the whole question of dialect, you know, in dialogue and the idea that some folks will try to write a specific dialect, but actually it can be more distracting than it is helpful and um, and to just go ahead and say it and and know that your reader is pretty smart too and can figure out that, of course, these folks live in this specific place, so they're not really speaking, you know, the King's English or what have you. Um, As a writer, your number one job is to make, make decisions, make choices, make editorial choices about your book. And if you're writing, especially genre fiction, the number one thing you really need to be thinking about is, is this going to take the reader away from just being lost in my novel? And if it does, then maybe you need to rethink it. Um, if, I could just, if I could just add to this, I actually bought a couple of months ago a novel by uh, uh, a Vietnamese American, and it's about it's like hidden figures. He's writing about two real Vietnamese characters in ancient Vietnam, two sisters who ended up leading an army of women to fight against uh, the, Chinese, uh, the Chinese invaders. And one of the things that we were talking about is all the diacritical marks for all the, the Vietnamese names. And we were talking about how we shouldn't use all those diacritical marks. You know, those are like full accents. Because every time you see them, it just is so glaring 
and it just makes you, it, it calls attention to itself and again, takes you away from the joy of reading the novel. So we decided we're going to take all the diet critical marks out there. Interesting. So one question that's sort of a follow-up is, where do you come down on when a book has another language in it? Do you expect that language to be italicized on the page or not? What's the best Guzman role for that? <laughs> I usually would because that's our house style. Every single, every single uh, publisher has uh, guidelines for how they treat the, uh, the design of, of a page of a book. And our house style is, if it's in a different language other than English, then we would italicize it. So even if it's just one word like hola, we would italicize it. And then I do want to follow up too that um, somebody had a question about that conversation we were just having about um, fiction and nonfiction. And they say, would historical fiction be something like a fiction slash nonfiction crossover? Um, what do you say to that? Historical fiction is fiction. It's fiction. It's not a nonfiction crossover. However, one of, the, one of the things I love about historical fiction is that I learned something new, and I would trust that the author has done their research so that what I'm reading is, 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 is true, especially if there's a reading group guide at the end of the book that says, oh, this, this came from a, this was inspired by a diary, or this, was, this came from a diary, or this was uh, from a, a newspaper article. I love reading those real things in fiction, but I would never ever say it was nonfiction because the whole book itself, really the bulk of the book is fiction, so it should be categorized as fiction. Right, it's just, it's just fiction that's been heavily researched. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it's a good question. I'm glad that um, Kelly asked that, okay. Um, and then last question that we had sent in, do you do, and this is more for, you know, a writer, but I guess I'm curious about what you're, what you think about this question in terms of the authors that you work with. Do you, do they do a lot of research about their characters or settings before they write or as they're writing? What is your experience in terms of, um, how authors tend to do a lot of the heavy research in their books? For most writers, writers who are writing contemporary books, you know, not science fiction, not fantasy, not horror, but you know, contemporary, um, I think they do their research as they're writing the book. If they realize, oh wait, I need to have my my people go to my my people are going to go to JFK. I better do some research in the JFK, the the John F. Kennedy Airport, and to see how it's laid out. So I think most of the times they do their research as they're writing. People who are writing legal legal thrillers, people who are writing uh, historical fiction, they do their research before they set out to write the book so that they can make sure that the way they're envisioning their book actually is proper. It actually works with how, it, how, how, um, how the legal system really works. If it's set in a, if it's based on, on, a, on a particular piece of real life, they, they, um, they already know what happened to that so they can figure out how to write their book and instead of getting writing themselves into a corner and then realizing, oh, I can't do that because I didn't do my research. I didn't realize that an attorney can, can't do that. So it saves them time when they're writing about something more specialized than just regular everyday life. So then a few questions that came in, um, does, how would you categorize or where does, uh, in terms of diversity, because there's been a lot of talk about diversity in publishing and having more diverse voices, where do um, LGBTQ voices fit in with that? And is there a particular um, genre or area that you see LGBTQ being, uh, being, what's the word represented and then also um are you guys when you say we're looking for more diverse voices is that a part of what you're looking for lgbtqia is part of diversity it's all about being inclusive and we're absolutely looking for lgbtqia um i'm going to talk about romance again just because one of the things i love about romance is just so open to new ideas it's always just just responding to what's important at the moment um last summer a book by an author named casey mcquiston hit the New York Times list, and that was a male-male gay romance, which I thought was so wonderful. We have, um, in our romance list, we have, uh, we have brought books where the protagonist is transgender. We have books with female-female. Um, 
romance with male male romance and on our the regular grand central publishing list we have uh, we have uh, uh, we have authors writing memoirs about uh, about their lgbtqia experience we published a nonfiction by caitlin jenner we were that we were the publisher who um, who did that that was that was nonfiction. but yeah i um I, every single publisher will tell you the same thing it's it's diversity it's inclusive and everybody's looking for them so it's can all you... about representing this wonderful, wonderful world we live in and the multiplicity of voices and experiences. Yeah, that's awesome, Beth. I'm so glad you're talking about this. Um, so can you speak to how, you know, from the beginning of us doing these live webinars since March, we've had these conversations and with some publishing folks and every time the question that we really need to ask just to hear what, what uh, the state might be right now. Um, what is the what does publishing look like right now in terms of submissions and uh, you know books being bought and the enthusiasm for new voices or debut authors or you know what does that look like? What does your inbox look like? What are agents doing? What can you say about today in publishing? Every editor went into publishing because they love reading books. And you know what? I think we tend to be addictive personalities because the very first time you read a book, a manuscript, and you started thinking, oh my God, this is wonderful. I want to buy this book. And you buy the book and you publish it. And it's just such a great, great rush. And every, every time we get a submission in our inbox, we're thinking, oh, this is the one that's going to give me that incredible rush, that incredible feeling in my stomach. Whether it's by an author who's been published by a small house and wants to write a bigger book, or whether it's a brand new author, there is such hunger for, for, for new voices, for, for people with a, a different point of view, for people who have something interesting to say about the world we live in. So it, there's never, never a shortage of submissions. There's never a shortage of interest in finding new voices and, uh, and just finding, finding people to talk about different things that, uh, that people are talking about and people are caring about. So, don't ever feel that, oh, that a, a publisher is happy with the authors they have. That's crazy. That's crazy. Everybody always wants new authors to publish. If, um, if, a, if an editor, if a publisher wasn't interested in a new author, they wouldn't have published Paul Hawkins. They wouldn't be publishing Ruth Ware. We wouldn't have published uh, The Paris Seamstress. So don't think that uh, the door is closed. Everybody's always looking for a brand new voice. And, and COVID-19 has not changed that. COVID-19 has not changed that. In fact, because we've all been working remotely, there's not the distraction of a million emails or people stopping by your workstation and talking to you and asking about, ooh, who got you those chocolates? We have actually bought more books since we started working remotely than before. Wow, more books, all right. More books ever before. Um, so I'm scrolling through to see what some of the other questions were and somebody did ask very early on. Um, uh, okay, wait, here's a very early question. I imagine a good number of us are still working to get a publishing opportunity. If and when a deal comes, which rights conditions as content creators should we most work to preserve? Oh, wow. Okay. I'll tell you what uh, is very, very standard. Um, authors, just to a person, keep commercial merchandising rights. That's the ability to be able to create merchandise based on your books. Like if you want to sell a coffee cup with your character's name on it, that belongs to you. Dramatic rights, performance rights, that's uh, uh, um, selling it to TV, to movie, optioning it to be turned into a movie or a streaming series. That always, always goes to the author. We never, ever get those. So those are just, just very simply the kinds of things that, uh, that you should keep. Everything else we really like to get because we like to be able to exploit all sorts. Oh, look at you. You got big. All sorts of, uh, <laughs> all sorts of um, different ways to be able to exploit the rest of the book and to be able to, um, to, um, to spread the word about the book in as many different formats as possible. So we want to buy all print rights. So we can do it in hardcover, trade paperback, mass market, graphic novel. We want to buy all ebook rights so we can, except for enhanced ebook rights, just straight ebook rights. We can do that. Audio, audio. Oh my God. For the past several years, audio just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. We don't think of those as different books. It's just different ways for people to read the same book. 
large print. We always believe that we want to keep, of course, we want to keep translation rights. And Becca knows all about that because she used to sell some rights. We want to keep translation rights so we can sell them to, uh, to foreign publishers and spread the word about your book all over the world. Um, yeah. Does that, it's, it's a big topic. <laughs> no, that's helpful. I mean, I think that it is less about what you, sh you know, what you should most work to preserve and more about just understanding the industry standards and how the industry works and the things that you're able to kind of push back on or not. And that's what an agent typically is there to do um, yeah. to make sure that yeah. that's preserved for you. That's an agent's expertise. Absolutely. So is it true that if the book is in the genre of magical realism, that the first chapter must contain an example of the magic? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no. All right. No. Well, I don't know who That's told fine. you that. I'm going to say no. No. It can happen in the second chapter. It can happen in the third chapter, I think. All right. You heard it here, folks. Um, and what about fan fiction? Can you talk about oh, fan fiction? Wow. <laughs> Well, you know, look at Fifty Shades of Grey, right? It started out as fan fiction that was supposed to be uh, uh, inspired by Twilight, but it's so different. Um, Wattpad. You, I hope everybody knows what Wattpad is. People write, um, not necessarily fiction, but people write fiction and everybody gets to read it. And they had a couple of big successes they sold after that series to, uh, to Simon & Schuster, which became a big hit to Simon & Schuster, then became a movie, and then became another great big book hit. I love fan fiction myself because maybe not necessarily for what they're writing, but if I'm looking for a writer, I'm, this, I said, we're always looking for fresh voices. So every once in a while, I will look at fan fiction and say, oh my God, look at that person's writing. That person's writing is great. Let's reach out to that author, that person who's writing that fan fiction and say if that author's interested in writing a book for us. So I may not necessarily want that fan fiction, but it's a great way for me to see that author's writing. <clears throat> I'm a big, big fan of Franny Fisher. Uh, Fisher's Murder Mysteries on a, I was on a, on Netflix, it's still on Netflix. And I've, I've done, I've looked at fan fiction because there's a wonderful romance in there and there's a wonderful mystery. And I wanted to see who can combine those two if I'm looking for romantic success. And I found some really wonderful, wonderful authors in fan fiction. What is the name of the show? Uh, Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries. It's wonderful. It's on Netflix. I hope it still is. You should watch it. It's great. It's set in the 1920s. She's such a... Franny Fisher sets herself up as an amateur detective, and she is so modern. She's so confident. She will stand up to anybody. She will do what she thinks is right, and she solves mysteries along, along the way. She has I a wonderful it. relationship with the, with the detective, the chief detective inspector. Ooh. Well, Beth, I think that we could ask you questions all night, but it is, I'm very aware of the time there, which is uh, another hour later than it is here in Austin. So it's about 1030 for you. So I, um, I just want to say a big thank you to you for sharing not only your, your smarts, but also your enthusiasm. And I think it's easy to see why your authors love working with you and why you are such a force in the publishing world and so thank you very much hook 'em horns um and <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me again i hope i was very helpful and more power to the written word or the spoken <laughs> word or the spoken word and we'll go back to what Beth said at the very start. If you have a specific question that you didn't get to ask tonight and you want to send it to me, I can assemble some more questions and maybe Beth will answer them at some point at her leisure and we'll, um, we'll get them back to you. But thank you to everyone here for being here um, and for spending your evening with us. And I really, really hope you'll consider coming to the One Page Salon on Saturday. It's going to be a lot of fun. You can find it on our website, on the calendar. And then we also have our summer writing retreat kicking off next week. So um, if you want to have just the best time ever in August, uh, other than being able to swim in a pool, it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. But um, thanks for being here, guys. And Beth, thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> good night, everyone. You're getting lots of love in the chat box. So, oh, good. Um, <laughs> oh, good. Um, <laughs> all right, lady, get out of here. Bye. <laughs> I'll see you soon.